for this morning. His name was Eustace Clarence Scrubs, and he almost deserved it. This morning, I want to talk to you about how we sometimes have unrealistic expectations of people, especially people who aren't Christians. See, so often we expect people to act like Christians before they even know Christ. I'm not talking about repentance before baptism. I'm talking about demanding people repent before ever hearing the gospel. It would be like me going up to uh, Sister Linda saying, Miss Linda, you got to stop drinking coffee. That's it. Well, why would she stop drinking coffee? Well, you know, bad things will happen if you drink coffee. Well, boy, that that makes a lot of sense. She's probably not going to drink coffee anymore, right? If you got your Bibles this morning, I want you to follow along with me. We're going to be in Romans chapter 2. And... Uh, In Romans, we're looking at the idea in chapter 2 of hypocrisy among Christians. Verse 1, therefore you are without excuse. Every man of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Be aware that this is not talking about Christians telling you what behavior is or is not condoned by God. These are talking about people who would tell you that you're going to be punished for what you're doing while going home and doing the same things. There's a lot of that in life. Most often you can see hypocrisy in a Christian's church life versus their work life. That's been the most common practice I've witnessed it in. People who come to church and, you know, get on about honesty and how integrity matters and all of these things, but they'll go and sell a lemon car to a customer. Or they'll intentionally misdirect somebody and some business dealing in order to make a profit. It's interesting how we try to limit how, how much God can be involved in our lives. Verse 2, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself, the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good Seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. Of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to every man who does good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. I, I read through our whole passage in one go because I wanted to, I, I hope that you hear in this that we are talking about Christians. We are talking about people who understand righteousness and choose unrighteousness anyways. Now we've, We've talked about the consequences. We've seen from the scripture the consequences of people who claim Christ and walk separate from him. My main goal this morning is to give you an illustration of of repentance. 
of what that looks like. And I, I hope that in this, you understand why people are the way they are. The world is a, it's a tough place for a lot of people. There's more struggles than any man can ever count. And everybody faces their own struggles. And for the most part, we really don't have any way of understanding what somebody else deals with. This life has a way of leading us to survival mode. We adopt the things that we need in order to survive what life throws at us. I mentioned uh, a name, and I don't know how many people recognize the name. I'm assuming even of the people who've read the book, most of you didn't immediately recognize it. How many of you have read the Chronicles of Narnia? A couple. So the name I gave is out of a book called The Dawn Treader. It's a kid's Kid series written by C.S. Lewis. And if you haven't read it, I, I really encourage you to go do so. There's a lot of great Christian ideas in there. Awesome illustrations. It's great for kids. Um, but there's a, a boy in there named Eugene Clarence Scrubs. And he is really identified as this horrible, judgmental, uptight little child. Right. And so their cousins, Lucy and Edmund, go to visit their cousin, Eugene, who makes fun of them because they've talked about Narnia. And he assumes it's a made up place come from their imagination, which he does not possess. In fact, his parents are described as um, Republican teetotalers who wear a certain kind of underwear. So it gives us an idea of the kind of person Eugene is being raised to be. So Lucy and Edmund, which is the younger of the original uh, siblings that went to Narnia, they go to visit Eugene and, and through a painting, they end up being transported back to this magical place where animals can speak. And so they, they enter into this voyage on a ship called the Dawn Treader. And they come upon an island which afterwards is called Dragon Island. And I know this is quite the story, but I hope that you bear with me. There is a point to all of this. Eugene goes off because they have to do repairs on the ship and he doesn't want to work. So he sneaks off to go explore the island. And he comes across a dragon who dies of old age in front of him. It starts to storm, and so he seeks cover in the dragon's lair and discovers a dragon treasure, which he wasn't expecting because, as C.S. Lewis says it, he doesn't read the right kind of books. He goes to sleep on this dragon treasure, and, he, and he's described as uh, being greedy. He has a dragon sleep on dragon treasure, dreaming dragon-like dreams. Before going to sleep, he puts a band around his arm that he finds in this great pile of treasure. And because of the greed with which he slept on this hoard of treasure, he wakes up a dragon. And talks about the extreme pain he feels in his arm because this band, which, which at one time was too big for him, is now too small. And so he goes to seek out the adventurers that are working on this ship, and he tries to explain to them that he's a dragon now. Except nobody really understands him, and they all really want to kill him because he's a dragon. And Lucy being Lucy, she, through a bunch of questions, discovers that this is in fact Eugene. He helps them rebuild this ship, but they were going to leave him behind because a ship can't hold a dragon. So, eventually, Eugene meets Aslan, which, if you've read the stories, is essentially the Christ-like character of the series, right? He's depicted as a lion who comes in and saves the day in every single book. 
Now, the wonderful thing is Aslan tells Eugene that if he wants to be a boy again, he must take off the dragon. And so Eugene starts trying to scrape off the scales, except he's a dragon. So he really doesn't get very far. And so Aslan tells him, you're going to have to let me take it off for you. And so the next scene is Aslan using his lion claws and cutting open this dragon hide and peeling this flesh off of this dragon to reveal a small boy. He then tells Eugene to go and bathe in the water to wash off the rest of the dragon. This dragon is what life ends up making us into. We grow scales to defend ourselves against the insults and everything else that people throw at us in life because the fact is people are more cruel than the world itself. And we develop our talons and our fangs to lash out at those who stand in our way because we're told that anyone who stands in your way prevents you from success, so they must be dealt with. So we develop our natural weapons that we can wield against them, and we learn to breathe fire because if you don't want to get burned, you have to burn them first. So often, we think that people need to come to Christ and somehow it takes them from being a boy into a man. But coming to Christ is about taking a dragon and making them into an innocent boy again. From there, we get the idea of spiritual maturity. When, As you grow into Christ, you become a man, but... A dragon can't become a man. And so that's the idea that we get from accepting and obeying the gospel. It's allowing Jesus to come and peel away all of those weapons we've developed and that thick hide that we wear to protect ourselves and reveal this innocent and weak and dependent boy once again. kind of a different take, isn't it? It's not usually what we demand of people when we tell them about Jesus. But I think you'll find that the people in the world are tired of being dragons. Most of them are exhausted because it's a fight they were never supposed to fight. We aren't designed to live like that. But without Jesus Christ, that's the only option they have. We come to understand the, the absolute dependency people have on being harsh and cruel people, right? When we start to be compassionate and empathetic towards why people develop into that kind of person, we all of a sudden understand how to talk to them about grace. Because people have a really bad habit of thinking that everybody thinks the way we do. We think that everybody sees the world the way we do. I, uh, I struggle with this, and I'm sure that I don't think I could point at a single person in this audience who doesn't also struggle. Because the fact is, I see the world in a certain way, and to me, that's the way the world is. So if you see it in a different way, clearly you're ignorant or blind, right? I mean, that's, that's how most of us think. But you see, most of us have actually expressed a desire to become that little boy again. And so it's hard. It's hard even after that to look at a dragon and see the boy that's inside. We just see mean people, cruel people, hateful people, hellbound people. 
it can be hard to recognize a creation of God after it's accepted the world. They don't look the same anymore. But we also have to accept that we have no power over this change. Just like, just like Edward, or I mean Eustace, we can scrape and claw all we want to at this hide and we can try to tear out our talons and our fangs, but the fact is, inevitably we fall short of the task because the world demands that we have those things. I think human beings are more susceptible to survival instincts than any living creature. You know, we call it ingenuity, you know, the development of using metals and concrete and rocks and wood to build buildings and changing our environment to fit our needs. But really, it's just a really, really complicated form of survival. You see, we can't match the speed of most animals. We can't match the strength of most animals. We don't have natural weapons like horns and claws and hooves. And so we find a way to conquer our environment to suit us. It's all about survival. And so when the world is cruel to us, as children especially, when the world is cruel and unyielding and uninviting and uncompromising, we do whatever it takes to survive it. I'm describing all of this to you because I want you to understand why people are the way they are. You see, we can't demand that the dragon just stop being a dragon. We can't demand that people who have learned to be angry and cruel just stop being angry and cruel. It doesn't work like that. Until, until they come to an understanding of Christ, there's no way for them to change. But you'll find that people are tired. They're tired of this big hulking form. They're tired of defending themselves against the attacks. They're tired of lashing out at people and for fear that they'll get hurt first. They're tired. They're looking for a way out. They just don't realize it yet. But we don't like talking to them about it. Because it makes us uncomfortable to be around those people. Because invariably, if we go out and seek people who don't know Jesus, and we try to talk to them about Jesus, we have to be able to brave the fire breath. And we have to be able to brave the claws. And we have to be able to look past the scales and the greed. And that can be hard. Most of us know the armor of God, even if you can't recite each piece. But do you realize that's the whole point of why God gives us that? That's the whole point of it. He doesn't arm us up so that we can go and be cuddly and fluffy, right? He arms us up because we're going to have to go and face those dragons. And he knows that they're not going to sit peacefully while we talk to them. Here's the worst part about it for me. You know, I congratulated the kids for how well they treated one another. In fact, it's been a long time since I've seen that many people in a room show nothing but respect for one another. And for you kids that I'm talking to, I want you to understand, I've seen a lot of adults in a room that can't act like that towards one another. I've preached at several different churches. I've attended a couple. And invariably, you see Christians, even within the church, 
more than happy to throw barbs at one another, more than happy to say cruel words to people. I was a waiter for a restaurant long before I ever knew any of you. And do you know, every single person that worked for that restaurant requested to never be scheduled on Sundays. We hated serving Christians. The most demanding, demeaning, and ungracious people you could ever hope to get in a restaurant. And more, most of the time, you'd be lucky to get a 10% left on the table. We hated Sundays. Isn't it interesting that that's the reputation we have as Christians? It's interesting, I say, because it is everything we are called to not be. So this is why we tie it into Romans chapter 2, because we come to church and we condemn the people who have a hard time with anger and and we condemn people who are hateful. We condemn the people outside of these walls who treat each other cruelly and without integrity. And meanwhile, it's the exact reputation we go out into the world and claim. Which one of those two people do you think God will judge more harshly? The people who took it upon themselves to judge others for the things that they have in their own life? or the people who are simply responding to what they know. Now, if you go a little bit further in Romans chapter 2, it talks about uh, even if you don't know any better, you will stand in judgment one day. It talks about how even unbelievers who act in accordance with the law without having the law become a law unto themselves. So essentially what we're talking about is Kind people are still kind even if they don't know Jesus. And mean people are still mean even if they say they serve Christ. And I'm convinced that we will face a certain kind of questioning from God for our willingness to tell people who is saved and who's not. We do it all the time. Churches of Christ are renowned for it, even among the denominational world. Our willingness to point at this or that and tell people because you see things differently or don't understand things the way we understand them, you're going to hell. It's a pretty lofty position to put yourself in. That of law interpreter and law keeper. Even in our human society, we don't allow people to hold both titles. I get it. It can be tough to be understanding. It can be tough to remind ourselves that not everybody has had the life we have had. I, uh, I'm not the most patient person I know. I'm not the most gentle. I'm not even the easiest to get along with. And most people will tell you because I speak so authoritatively, I seem unapproachable. Leftover survival instincts. You don't need to understand it to be compassionate. The same things with people who learn to be quiet and sit back and shrink themselves in front of others. It's a survival instinct, right? Because if you don't notice me, you won't attack me. If nobody notices me, I will never have to do anything that makes me uncomfortable. I don't understand it. I've never really been that way. But I don't have to understand it 
to care about the person who does. That's the beauty of all of this. God doesn't tell you that you have to understand everything about one another. He doesn't tell you that we have to see the world the same way. He doesn't even tell you that you have to be in the same exact place in your relationship with God. But he does tell you that you got to care. We call it love. This idea that even when we're at odds in our views and our opinions, even when we're at odds at our approach, even when we're in the middle of arguing with one another, the idea of caring for one person so deeply that you will make sure that they don't have to put those scales and those claws back on. People sometimes have a hard time looking at these books, the Chronicles of Narnia, and seeing the biblical themes throughout it, but Eustace Scrubs is the epitome of what coming and obeying the gospel looks like. You see, after Eustace is stripped of his dragon hide and he becomes that little boy again, and after Aslan tells him to go wash himself in the waters to rinse the remnants off of him, he goes back And he joins Lucy and Edmund on the ship. And they all agree that he suddenly became a better person. More tolerable. More tolerant. More agreeable. Kinder. More understanding. Now after, towards the end of the story, when they leave Narnia and return back to Eustace's household... Everyone in Eustace's life also agrees that he is a far better person. And they all enjoy being around him much, much more. Except his parents. They call him a disappointment. They call him insufferable. They call him plain and commonplace. Most of us seek the approval of our relatives. I think it's natural to appreciate their opinions of us. But you see, once you've had that dragon hide stripped of you, there's opinions that matter a whole lot more than theirs. It's not about rebuilding that thick skin so that you can handle the world's barbs once again. It's about understanding the innocence that has been restored to you and working to maintain that innocence. I know this is a little bit different than many of my lessons that you've heard. It's not structured the same. It's not presented the same but I've really had a hard time lately explaining to people how we're supposed to see other people. And I wanted to give you an insight into the world's mentality so that maybe when you meet the next cruel and hateful person, rather than just not liking them or avoiding them, maybe you can kind of understand or start to understand why they became that way. The kids are telling me that my time is up. So, we're going to take some time here to invite you. Right? We're called to repent. We're called to strip ourselves of that hide and those claws. But we're also called to understand when we have prevented others from doing that. We're called to confess. Jesus as Lord, but we're also called to confess when we struggle to be compassionate with one another, when we struggle with hypocrisy and judgment and condemnation, 
It's good to confess these things to one another so that others can beseech God on your behalf. <coughs> Last but not least, we're called to strip ourselves of the things that the world has taught us. We're called to wash clean the remnants that the world has left upon us. We're called to be resurrected, a new creation, with a new hope, with a new purpose, so that we become new and better people, more patient, more gracious, more generous, more agreeable, more tolerant. If we can help you with any of these things this morning, we ask that you bring them forward and make them known so that we can help you see them met as we stand and sing.